Greetings, mortals. Welcome to Fatal Fortunes. I'm Al. I'm Nathan. Join us for a deep dive into some of history's most fascinating characters who live dangerously beautiful lives and whose legacies haunt us today. Okay, guys, welcome back to another episode of Fatal Fortunes. We're like halfway through season two. We're working on getting some fun guests in uh, for subsequent episodes in 2022. And I guess we'll just start right here with our latest subject. It's Anime Wong, um, you know, Chinese American actress, really bomb bitch. And she was born in 1905. Such a great year. (laughs) You think so? No, no, I don't. (laughs) I don't think so at all. Are any of these good years? Uh, no. Every year, every year since the Industrial Revolution has been bad. Even before that. Okay, yeah, that too. Wait, before we get into 1905, I gotta tell you what I'm drinking. What are you drinking? I am drinking a peach vibe Celsius on ice with some orange juice in it. Peach and orange sounds very good. Yeah. You know, we got three take-home exams to do. We got, you know, 60 pages to write over the next week. And um, this is going to get us through. This is going to get me through. This is... Just right now. (laughs) This is... is, You thought it was a stout. You're You're not far off. It really tastes like a stout, but it's actually a lager. It's a black lager called Hidden Mechanism. Look at this guy pondering his orb on the front there. So that's uh, for the people watching along. Cute. Also, also for the people watching at home, Al's got on an awesome Diana shirt, which was that the one that we saw Spencer with? Yeah. yeah. Will you screenshot this right now? Yeah. It is among the Diana shirts that I brought to when Nathan and my friend Viv and I, we saw Diana in the theaters, or Spencer in the theaters. Oh, speaking of Spencer, what's up with my poster? Oh, shit. It did leave. Oh, my God. I haven't even asked. Okay. I got to ask. I would I'll almost like reach um, out. I would almost like you to text him right now. We can add like a fun little SpongeBob interruption and then we can cut away to when he responds True. hopefully later in this episode. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> okay. I'm texting him right now. Yeah, and Nathan and I were planning our little um retreat in the woods for the beginning yeah. of the year. Oh my god, have you ever shot a gun? Yeah. Okay. But only I was like we like, could go shoot in a couple times, but I would okay. need like I would need to be taught again it's been a few years yeah i'm usually like one and i'm done the only reason i don't object is because it feels very princess diana as we saw from the movie the queen has has been shown in photos at her balmoral cabin with jeffrey epstein and glenn maxwell she's in the pics oh yeah she's in them she's (gasps) like chilling with them invited them over are you keeping up with that trial Oh, I am. I want to read the final judgment so I understand what the jury said was fact. Did you see that one courtroom sketch of her drawing this courtroom sketch artist? And she's, like, looking directly at the courtroom sketch artist. And the sketch has her drawing the court. It's so scary. She's so scary. And she's going to get off completely free. You like, think so? F- no. Yeah. Yes. No. Yes. They're trying her in the Southern District of New York, which has a 98% conviction rate. All right. Well, So maybe her odds she'll... of winning are 2%. Oh, my God. Imagine if this episode comes out and, like, the jury's already back. Like, if by Tuesday the jury's already back. Ooh, we could talk about that next time. Wow. Yeah. Um, back yeah, to 1905, I guess. A hundred years past. Yep. My safe, happy place a hundred years ago. <laughs> God. <laughs> you, do you want to tell us what's been going? You take it away, because I think that you're um, most excited I do about always the Russian love, Revolution. I, uh, I always, I did. There were multiple things on here that I, like, typed in, and then I noticed that you had already typed them in. And one of them was the Russian Revolution. Hell yeah. Let's keep going with socialism. But that was the failed one. We die. And that didn't work out too well. Yeah, it was Bloody Sunday. For um, a very in-depth look on the 1905 re- Revolution, go listen to the Revolutions podcast where there's, like, 35 episodes on it. A shoe yeah. factory exploded in Brockton. That's awful. Killing 58 people. The Cullinan Diamond, it's the biggest diamond at the time, was found in 
uh, Azania or South Africa. Vegas Baby, that was one I accidentally typed in twice because I was so excited about Vegas, founded in Nevada. Have you been to Vegas? I've never been. Um, Sorry. And No, I mean, I think I'm all right. I, I feel like... No, you're all right. You don't need to I go. wouldn't like it. I don't like crowds. I don't like it. Sweden and Norway, ooh, saddest breakup of the century. Break up. <laughs> 8.4 earthquake in Mongolia. That is huge. That must have been pretty devastating. Equally devastating, cars are going faster than ever. Over 100 miles per hour in Daytona. Good God. Einstein finishes his quantum theory of light paper. Taft, William Howard, uh, the guy that we're not taught at all except for that one bathtub fact. Um, he continues to do evil shit in the Philippines because America okay. loves to colonize. Yeah. Was Taft president then? I thought Teddy Roosevelt was president in mm, 1905. He might have been in Congress because another thing that we're not taught is that he held all three branches of government at during his lifetime. Like he was Supreme Court justice, president, and in Congress, so... You know, in my whole two years of law school, I've never read an opinion by Justice Taft. Because they're probably all bad opinions. He was racist as fuck. No, we read the racist ones. Oh, Especially. Well, oh. You should read Taft, then. He's... We he's, don't read any gr- fun yeah. ones or anything. We don't read anything that's about happiness and roses. It's all about, you mm. know, segregating parks and fucking abortion. Yeah. And... If we weren't demonetized before, we're demonetized now. Um, oh, he was the Secretary of War. Oh, okay, my bad. My bad. He was the Secretary of War. Well, that explains why he's in charge of doing this evil shit. Um, in this year also, Jules Verne and the founder of the YMCA, George Williams. They both pass away. Oh, so, I yeah. don't know. I was clapping. I thought you were going to say that they were born. Oh, no. They died. <laughs> they both died. <laughs> father, of, father of sci-fi, father of YMCA, gone. But uh, people who were born, Christian Dior, Henry Fonda, Greta Garbo, and Howard Hughes. But they're not important right now. We're, we're focusing on Anime Wong. So let's get into it. Yes, Anime Wong was born Wong Louis Song on January 3rd, 1905. And her name means Willow Frost. Willow Frost was first born on Flower Street in Los Angeles, and she was the second of seven children to Wong Sam Singh, who was a laundry owner, and he had Anna with his second wife, Les Gon Toy. Her parents, they were second generation Chinese Americans, and she had had family in the United States since at least 1955. So they've been in the U.S. way before the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which wasn't repealed until 1943, in case anyone was wow. wondering. That is not surprising, but also very surprising. Holy shit. Especially since they were our allies in World War II for at least mm. a couple of years before then. You know, her dad, he might have been a bigamist. Um, He had a family in China also, and when Anna was five, her family moved near to where um, the Staple Center is today. So they move off of Flower Street, and they move to more downtown. They went from a really diverse neighborhood to being the only Chinese family on their block. But this change of scenery, it really did help Anna learn American culture. Like, she was really forced to assimilate. And she attended a public school at first with her older sister, but they were bullied and subjected to racism. So they ended up moving to a Christian-run Chinese school, and they also attended Chinese language school on the weekend. Which is interesting because later in her life, Anna, um, when she goes to China, she needs to have an interpreter. So I'm like, did you not pick it up in Chinese school? Or maybe you were going to a Chinese school that reflected the same, like, dialect of the village your family was from? I think I read that later that, um, yeah, a lot of people in China were pissed at her because she wasn't speaking Mandarin, but like a different dialect. So I think you're onto something with that. Yeah. Maybe she just didn't pick it up in school. I know that going to fucking Saturday schools, like ripping her teeth out. It was around the same time when she's a child that uh, filmmaking pioneers on the East Coast are fleeing for warmer climates like the burgeoning Los Angeles. So Anna used to skip school and use her lunch money to watch the Nickelodeons. And Anna hung around these Nickelodeons long enough that she was actually given a role as Curious Chinese Child. 
as like an extra. Then when she was 11, she had finally come up with her stage name, Anna Mae Wong. At 14, Anna was working at a department store when a casting agent from Metro Pictures came in looking for 300 female extras. She gets a part in a movie called Red Lantern where you guessed it, she's holding a lantern. She doesn't tell her dad about the gig. Her dad, he's very superstitious. He's like, be photographed enough. They steal your soul, which sounds like someone else's proverb. But over the next two years of high school, she continues to work as an extra. She's at the department store. So she's balancing her studies and work. And she also has a really crazy bout of illness that um, was super common in the 1920s. It was called... Sidenham's? Chorea. I don't know, actually. I think it's Chorea. But because I was looking at it, and I was like, does this say cholera? And no, it does not. It does look like that, but it's not. I've never seen that word before. Nope, never but seen that word, it? never heard of that disease. The disease is where you have uncontrollable leg movements that last from anywhere from a few weeks to six months. She ends up actually being cured with traditional Chinese medicine, but that doesn't lead her to be a steadfast advocate of it. In 1921, Anna dropped out of Los Angeles High School to pursue acting full-time. She said about this time in her life, I was so young when I began that I knew I still had youth if I failed, so I was determined to give myself 10 years to succeed as an actress. And I would, I'd say she succeeded. Oh, yeah. I think she did that. At the age of 17, Anna got her first leading role. It was in a silent Technicolor film, you know, one of the first, called The Toll of the Sea. The film was originally believed to be lost, but UCLA made a complete version, or as complete as possible version, in 1985 that's missing the last two reels. But it's really exciting that culture that we thought we lost, we still have. The New York Times said of Anna's performance, Miss Wong stirs in the spectator all the sympathy her part calls for, and she never repels one by an excess of theatrical feeling. She had a difficult role, a role that is botched nine times out of ten, but hers is the tenth performance, completely unconscious of the camera, with a fine sense of proportion and remarkable pantomimic accuracy. She should be seen again and often on the screen, which is like, what the, it's like got those Hollywood backhanded compliments in it. Am I wrong in thinking that? Because all of their reviews of her stuff later are just scathing but yeah they're racist they are but it's important when seeing like you know the stuff she was up against even though anna gets these amazing backhanded reviews because of her ethnicities the studio heads are reluctant to put her in more leading roles of course since anna had been hanging around film sets for so many years now she had name recognition around hollywood but hollywood doesn't know how to pigeonhole her because that was all that happened in hollywood you got pigeonholed after pigeonholed after pigeonholed And that's honestly why a lot of people's careers I don't think last, because there's only so many times you can play one role before, you know, you lose your consumer. I think especially for uh, women in Hollywood, unfortunately, that is that is so much more the case where you just, yeah, you lose it after a while because people are uh, subscribing to patriarchy. And like it's a miracle Nicole Kidman still has a career. That AMC Her movies in the 2000s were bad, dude. Yeah, what was that one that she was in? The Golden Compass. Oh, man. Yeah. That one was bad. That took her out for a few years. Because I remember she was supposed to produce The Danish Girl, and she was supposed oh. to star in it. Oh. And then, like, huh. that deal totally fell apart, and we have The Danish Girl we know today, which I saw at the Kendall Square Cinema. Oh, rough. Hey, speaking of the Kendall Square Cinema, I was going to leave this till the end, but now that you mentioned it, great news. The poster's yours. And apparently... Woo! All of the staff wanted it, and my boss had to lie and say that it was for me. Yeah. So, the boss that doesn't like you lied? No, 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 no. This is oh. the boss that likes me. Both of my bosses liked me. Just one was upset that I looked into employees' salaries. That's all. That you cared, which isn't yeah. a crime anymore in mass, or isn't unlawful. Starting off this next portion of Anna May Wong's Hollywood stardom, just by saying, hey, anti- miscegenation laws are evil i I had to look up that word because i had no idea how to pronounce it but basically it's their way of of keeping her down and anyone of a race that isn't considered white um they're basically laws that yeah are 
trying to continue to segregate, segregate, and we'll just see that pop up again and again throughout her filmography. So yeah, the rest of the country is still very much against any kind of intimate relationship between Whitey and literally anyone else who wasn't like from the pasty places. And because of this, it's 1924, um, you know, Italians and Irish people aren't even considered white people at this point. Um, although they are having a much easier time than anyone from a continent different than Europe. So Anna is typecast, as we said. She's typecast again and again with a second role in the film The Thief of Baghdad. She plays someone from Mongolia. Um, gotta love Hollywood for at least not casting Scarlett Johansson. But <laughs> <laughs> this character, Holy shit. I mean, is a villain. That's that's the definition of the stereotype of quote unquote dragon lady. Um, so she's seductive, she's deceitful, mysterious, and oh my god, so racist. So fuck Hollywood. Then the costume was and cute. yes, but fuck Hollywood then and still to this day. That's something to note about her costumes. Like she is known for her dress, and we will get into that later. But yes, this this movie had very lavish costumes and set pieces. Um, oh, and right now, this is my PSA for anyone who was planning to see Licorice Pizza to not, because I've heard that there's a lot of racist depictions of Asians on top of the predatory behavior of the 25-year-old or 24-year-old to the 15-year-old boy. So, like, don't go if see If you want to watch a nasty movie, just go see, what is it called? With Matthew McConaughey. Interstellar. Love them high school <laughs> girls. They stay the same age. Oh fuck! What I've never called? dazed and confused. Like there we go. If you want to see yeah. licorice pizza, go watch Dazed and Confused. Yeah, I've never seen that one either, though. Can't can't say. So you, wait. So you didn't see licorice pizza? You just heard it was bad. No, I've just heard it. I'm not going to see it, and no one should see it. I yeah, just looked weird. But this movie that she's in, uh, The Thief of Baghdad, it does get her in front of. American audiences, like, a little bit more than her extra roles. So, at this time, unfortunately, she's in a relationship with a director named Todd... Oh, Todd Browning. He's 44. Gross. Um, but everyone else hates this relationship for racist reasons. Um, so that doesn't last long. And after the success of that movie, which grossed $2 million, which I did the math, it's $32 million today, she moved into her own apartment. She starts dressing like a proper flapper of the 1920s. Um, some say because, you know, although she's born in America, people see her as, like, very foreign, as they do with any person that, again, is not whitey. Um, and... With this new money, she starts to make a deal to procure, uh, produce her own movies with Anna Mae Wong Productions. She wants to, like, tell Chinese stories. However, her business partner in this endeavor was found to be doing some, quote, unethical business practices, unquote. I couldn't find out what exactly those were, but they were also cited as dishonest. So who knows what that was. But because of this dishonesty, she never saw that deal she uh, starts a lawsuit with this partner, and the company was dissolved. So that's really unfortunate about... Hollywood was built on dishonesty. I don't understand the problem. I know. She wasn't with it, though. She wanted to be honest. So what she wants, really, is to stop being typecast, and maybe that's why she was trying to make this production studio so she could have the say, because uh, she doesn't want to be the dragon lady or the vamp, femme fatale, you know, whatever you want to call it another name for just another villainous Asian person because she doesn't want to be portrayed like that. She doesn't want Asian people to be portrayed as that. And she's given plenty of roles um, as people of other races as well. Like I said, she played someone from Mongolia. She also plays some indigenous peoples in the movies Peter Pan and The Alaskan in that same year. And then the following year, in 1925, she and a few other Hollywood stars attempt to to do a vaudeville circuit around California, but I couldn't find out a lot about who exactly else was involved 
and unfortunately the tour did not go as successfully as they had hoped, so she just returns to acting. Then the next year, in 1926, she helps to put the first rivet in the Grauman's Chinese Theater in Los Angeles, along with Norma Talmadge at its groundbreaking ceremony. Notably, however, she is not asked to leave a hand or footprint in the cement. That same year, she stars in a movie where she and other a- Asian actors are playing Asian roles, finally, like, like what they're supposed to be doing. No more white people playing Asians, please. That's was, really rude to say to Scarlett Johansson. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, so, that's so bad. This movie, it's set in the Ming Dynasty. It's called The Silk Bouquet, later renamed The Dragon Horse in 1927. Um, so again, she's unfortunately still in the same roles as either the self-sacrificing butterfly or dragon lady. Like, the two sides of a, a very similar coin of just, yeah, making Asian women look bad. And that is seen in films like Old San Francisco in 1927. And then she's also still dealing with those stupid anti-miscegenation laws with people being racist about an interracial couple on screen. So she can't kiss anyone who isn't also Asian. And there's really only one other, like, employed, consistently Asian actor. And it takes a while for her to work with him. So she's cast as supporting roles in Mr. Wu in that same year, 1927, and then the following year in the movie The Crimson City. Anna's, of course, sick of being typecast and passed over for lead roles, even when the story calls for an Asian lead. So she picks up her life and moves to Europe at the age of 23. She said of her reasoning later in life, there seems little for me in Hollywood because rather than real Chinese, producers prefer Hungarians, Mexicans, American Indians for Chinese roles. She ends up performing in mostly German-speaking countries, and the press said of her, Fräulein Wong had the audience perfectly in her power, and the unobtrusive tragedy of her acting was deeply moving, carrying off the difficult German-speaking part very successfully. Crazily enough, Wong becomes besties with Lenny Reifenstahl. Whoa. (laughs) Of course, for those of you who are living under a rock, Lenny Reifenstahl was the famous Nazi collaborator and propaganda artist who did, you know, Triumph of the Will. Yeah. A bunch of propaganda for Hitler. She was kind of one of the only women who was given um, a real role within the Nazi party. Because, of course, the Nazi party ideology was that women stay home and have seven babies. She also became friends with Marlena Dietrich and Cecil Cunningham at this time, and her healthy female relationships lead to rumors of her being a lesbian that damage her public reputation even more and lead to private embarrassment with her family. And of course, they're just, they're not gonna, no press at the time is gonna see, you know, a happy, healthy, mixed race friendship and not twist it in any other way. They're not gonna twist it in any positive way, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in any way other than, they must be lesbians, let's ruin her more. After working in film and theater in Germany, Anna makes her way to the London circuit. She starred in the play A Circle of Chalk opposite young hottie Laurence Olivier, where critics were really favorable to Anna in Germany. In London, they mock her California accent, and this leads to her taking voice lessons at Cambridge University. It was also at the same time in her 20s that she acted in the last silent film of her career, which was Piccadilly, in which she had a starring role. Although she often plays a temptress, censorship meant, as Nathan said, that she couldn't kiss her white counterparts, and some say Piccadilly is Anna's best film. And someone actually uploaded the movie to YouTube, and we will put a link for that in the show notes on our website, fatalfortunes.com. Anna's love life while in Europe has her link to... Oh my god, I literally cannot say any of these names. Nathan, say it. Eric, I think it's Eric Maxwitz. But he's married. Anna is in her first talkie in 1930, which is called The Flame of Love. Sometimes it's also called Road to Dishonor. I don't like this changing of movie titles after it's come out. I'm not into it. Yeah, me neither. It's making it harder to find on IMDb. Amen. In this movie, she records lines in French, English, and German, but the movie's a flop. I think what's more miraculous is that she's even able to transition from a silent movie career into a talking movie career. Yeah. Because, of course, there's so many people who just get left to the wayside. But I think that that honestly is owed toward her California accent. But Anna's got to go back to Hollywood. What happens when she goes back to Hollywood? 
Well, now she's got a bunch of success in Europe, and Hollywood wants her to be a star um, because they're looking for, quote, fresh European talent, which I thought was so funny. It's it's obviously <laughs> hilarious. Like, oh, God. She's born in America. <laughs> she's All right. Well, anyway, she signs to Paramount with the promise of lead roles, more money, and she, at that time, also is starring on Broadway in a show called On the Spot, which was a drama, and that she would later turn into a movie called Dangerous to Know. More on that later. Notably, in this production of the play, their director asked if she could do some offensive, um, but in his eyes, quote-unquote, authentic (laughs) Japanese gestures, to which she was like, no, I'm professionally trained, and I'll do it in a way that isn't offensive. So she uses the knowledge that she has procured um, and uses her own authentic gestures instead of somebody else's, which is, I think, very commendable of her to stand up to this guy. All throughout the 1930s, she would continue to do live stage shows, cabaret performances when possible. Unfortunately, though, tragedy fell in 1930 when Anna's mother was struck by a car in front of their home on Figueroa Street. The family stays in that house for four more years, all the while Anna is paying for her younger sibling's education. And after that tragedy in 1930, uh, the decade doesn't get better at first. In 1931, she's promised a prominent role in a well-known director's movie, Josef von Sternberg. Um, Never heard of him. And me neither. But apparently he's hot shit in 1931. To get this role, she has to play one more stereotypical evil Chinese woman. Oh boy. She's the titular character of the fictional and evil Dr. Fu Manchu um, in the movie Daughter of the Dragon. So she's his daughter. And notably in this film, she acts alongside another very notable Asian actor. He's uh, so hot. I'm sorry. He's a cutie. Is he? Mm-hmm. Like I mentioned before, Sesua Hawakawa. But she's only paid $6,000 for the movie, and its lead actors paid double, which all, isn't that guy. It's someone else. So that's fucked up. Um, it's, you know, one positive thing out of the movie is it did garner her even more celebrity in America. And with that, she uses that platform a little bit. She starts uh, speaking out against the film in an article titled I Protest with Film Weekly. She unabashedly slams the negative stereotyping in that film, as well as countless others at the time. Quote, she says, uh, Why is it that the screen Chinese is always the villain? And so crude a villain, murderous, treacherous, a snake in the grass. We are not like that. How could we be? With a civilization that is so many times older than the West. Unquote. Which, like, yeah. I've said it before on this show, I think. I'll say it again. Uh, Speaking from my european ancestors europe fucking sucks like we're so we're we're the savages like we didn't know how to bathe until like a couple centuries ago so uh she's absolutely right Jesus. that she shouldn't be given <laughs> yeah we're fucking disgusting we're just thinking about how dirty our scottish ancestors were so she's she's dead on with that quote about yeah sick and tired of of being given these um, diminishing roles. Like it's, it's ridiculous. She's had to prove herself again and again. But also in this time, uh, 1931, she's delving into the political sphere, speaking out against the Japanese who are beginning to invade Manchuria. So she's speaking out against their actions. And while she's getting more popular in the West, China was and always had been giving her mixed reviews on her films. She finally got that movie that she was promised with Josef von Sternberg, and it's a movie called Shanghai Express. And like we said before um, about the lesbian rumors, there were rumors even more because of this movie because she's with that co-star, Marlene Dietrich. Um, And yeah, it's basically assumed that because of their sexually charged scenes that they're in a relationship. So... Many do believe that in this movie, uh, Wong actually is upstaging Dietrich a lot. So either way, the haters hated 
and China was definitely one of those. They write a newspaper headline that reads, Paramount utilizes anime Wong to produce picture to disgrace China. Ugh. People really just believed that her on-screen sexuality was giving Chinese women a bad name just because she was beautiful, to be perfectly honest, because, I mean, there were people in China that loved her. Um, Peking University gave her an honorary doctorate in 1932, and she's the only actor to have ever been awarded that. And yes, she was listed as the most beautiful Chinese woman in Look magazine and the world's best-dressed woman by the Mayfair Mannequin Society in New York. That's cool. Yeah, she's obviously so much more than those things, but like we said earlier about her fashion, like she is held in high regard in that aspect uh, because she had a great taste. Truly unfortunate that racist Hollywood keeps hiring white people to play Asian roles, um, as they've been doing for decades, as they still do. We can't hammer home that point enough, guys. (laughs) Um, That, yeah, we have to remember Scarlett Johansson, but... um, (laughs) It's 1935. I'm sorry, every time. I'm every time. Off. I'm glad. I'm glad for it. It's 1935, and she tries out for this role, and it's not given to her. It's given to a German woman. Don't so, you know Germans are really close to Asia? Don't you know? Haven't yeah, you it's like right there. It's like right there. <laughs> Alex, Alex tells me all the time, Europe is just the little tiny peninsula of Asia. Like, why are we even considering Europe a continent at this point? It's connected. Excuse you, it's called white supremacy. Come on. Oh, Show you're right. respect, okay? <laughs> you're right. Now we're definitely demonetized. They obviously, in this movie, do what they do in Hollywood. They put on a bunch of makeup and make her look more Chinese. And um, it's even more offensive that she gets an Oscar for this performance. Notably, Anime Wong um, is in the audience when... Louise Rayner is giving that acceptance speech. And she was almost in that movie um, because instead of the role that she wanted, the lead role, she was offered a very small part named Lotus. To that, she said, quote, I'll be glad to take the test, the screen test, but I won't play the part. If you let me play Olan, I'll be very glad. But you're asking me, with Chinese blood, to do the only unsympathetic role in the picture, featuring an all-American cast portraying Chinese characters. So, yeah, again, fuck Hollywood for this. So, it's, like, not a big surprise, but again, big surprise there with Hollywood giving her the worst parts. Um, And, yeah, she does not end up doing this movie. And again, Anna's fed up. She's got to get out of here, so this time... She decides to go, I'm like, oh my god, what direction is that? West to China. And she spends a year on tour of China. It's the only time she actually ever goes. And she ends up visiting, you know, her family, her father's home village, you know, and other other big places like Beijing, Shanghai, etc. Her father had actually returned to China with her younger siblings in 1934 after, of course, you know, Anna's mother died. And, of course, he has another wife back home who's probably saying, I wonder where he is. She told the San Francisco Chronicle, For a year I shall study the land of my father's. Perhaps upon my arrival I shall feel like an outsider. Perhaps instead I shall find my past life assuming a dreamlike quality of unreality. And, you know, she she finds the former. It's not the latter. Anna arrives in China in January of 1936 and wrote about her experiences for the New York Herald Tribune. It was at this time that Anna expressed her intentions to never marry. Uh, She's had plenty of relationships before, as we've mentioned, but she decides that she is married to her work. She faces criticism from the nationalist government in China because she speaks her own dialect of Chinese, not Mandarin, which is something that they're really trying to push for. But you know, that nationalist government ain't long for this world, so whatever. She felt strange, you know, using an interpreter to talk to her own people, and the pressures of international fame lead to Anna's excessive smoking and drinking at this time, so she's, this is not the dreamlike vacation she had planned, this is a very stressful time. All this pressure eventually leads her to be rude to a waiting crowd in Hong Kong, and they chase her through the streets. She ends up spending 10 days at her family's village before she continues on on her tour, Um, She reflected, I'm convinced that I could never play in Chinese theater. 
I have no feeling for it. It's a pretty sad situation to be rejected by Chinese because I'm too American and by American producers because they refer other races to act Chinese parts. So she can't win. She has to go back to America after this tour. And in order to finally finish the contract that she has with Paramount, she is doing a string of B movies. Critics don't care for them at all. Like I said, like so many racist reviews by the New York Times and others. But Chinese American news actually loved that she was playing like a lot of non stereotypical roles now. One of her favorite roles was in Daughter of the Dragon, which had the working title The Anime Wong Story because of how specific the writing was for her. Like they had to re- rework a lot of the lines because they wanted her to really stand up. And she's no longer a passive bystander, she's the sole reason that this plot is kicking off. And to nice. The Hollywood Reporter, she says, quote, I like my part in this picture better than any I've had before because this picture gives the Chinese a break. We have sympathetic parts for a change. To me, that means a great deal. So the New York Times actually loves this one, and this film was entered into the Library of Congress in 2006. She also starred in that rework of the Broadway play I'd mentioned earlier in 1938, This is the film Dangerous to Know. It's torn apart by racists. They don't like it at all. They think the acting is horrible, whatever. She has another role in King of Chinatown, which has her playing a surgeon who turns down their promotion to help fight with China against the invading Japanese. So her political ideals are even getting involved in these B-movies. During this time, Paramount also employed her as a tutor to other actors like Dorothy L'Amour, And she also appears on some radio shows and continues to perform in cabarets, which had her later tour to Europe and Australia. And throughout all of this, she continues to speak out against Japanese imperialism against China. Okay, we're going to wind this episode down, you know. The point of Fatal Fortunes is a lot of these people, they don't don't get that happy ending. They don't get to live that long. It's pretty sad, you know. Who who is our longest-lived subject, do we think? Oh, jeez, I don't know. I mean, honestly, I feel like Anna Mae Wong is a little bit older than most, um, just because she was 56. But I don't know. We'll have to we'll have to do some research on that. Ms. Mary Shelley. Oh, oh my God, they're tied. Oh my God, these tabs are gonna ruin my computer. Anna kept acting in her later life. She starred in anti-Japanese propaganda films and donated her salary from these movies to United China Relief. You can actually watch a couple of these online. Um, one has Burma in the title, and the other one is the one I mentioned earlier, Lady from Kang Kung. Or Kung King. Lady from Kung King. She also donated her costumes to the Chinese Benevolent Association of California. And like we said, like she was really known for her fashion. This was basically like that time that Diana auctioned off all of her gowns in the 90s. In 1945, her father died in Los Angeles. You know, he had moved back later in life, and he actually lived to be 91. After a six-year hiatus from film, she returned in a B-movie. You know, this is the rise of the B-movie period, um, where, you know, the cost of making films is going down because it's more widespread, etc. And this movie's called Impact, um, and that movie is actually in the public domain. I don't know why, but Interesting. it is. Huh. It belongs to all of us. In 1951, she starred in a detective series called The Gallery of Madame Louis Song, which is her name. And this role was actually written especially for her. And like I said, they use the re- her real name for the character. Um, no copies of the show or the script have survived to present, though. So it's a lost TV show, which is pretty sad. She's also, you know, an ardent Democrat. We've seen her fighting against fascism for quite a long time now. And she supports Adele Stevenson during the 1952 presidential election. I think a lot of Democrats supported Adele Stevenson. And all we know is... People supported him, not about anything he actually did because he didn't get elected. It was around this time that Anna began investing in real estate across Hollywood. Like, what do you do? You're an old actress in Hollywood. What else is there left to do but invest in real estate? Am I right? And it was around this same time that uh, her health was also declining. Um, She managed her apartments until 1956, but she had previously had an internal hemorrhage that was brought on by, you know, her financial worries, drinking, menopause. 
So she has to stop managing her apartments and ends up going to live with one of her brothers. She also narrates a documentary about China, and it's one of the first documentaries about China, not like narrated by a Chinese person. And it is used alongside footage from her 1936 tour, which I also found through the UCLA archives. And, um, you know, she, she just carries herself like an American. Like, you see her walking through crowds of people, and she's just so striking. And she, like, has, I don't know, what's the word for the action I'm doing right now, Nathan? She's just, like, a lot. You can see, like, how she, has she a certain is in her je ne sais quoi. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, she's just really striking. She's also so skinny. I was like, oh, my God, look at what happens to people when there's no antibiotics in their food. In 1960, which I think is really nice, you know, she lives long enough to get to be at them giving her a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So where first they had snubbed her and not let her put her fan yes. prints in the Gurman's Chinese Theater, they do still honor her in her lifetime. And um, you can go see that today. Her likeness is also used for the Gateway to Hollywood sculpture, uh, along with Dolores Del Rio, a Fatal Fortunes alum, Dorothy Dandridge, and Mae West. So I think those are some good choices, and I think that they, um, this is at least someone tried to represent diversity in Hollywood. If you look at the statue, they all look the same, except, like, Anime Wong has bangs. <laughs> Great. Awesome work, and, like, artists. Dorothy Dandridge has, like, relaxed hair. <laughs> cool. All right, great. But, you know, that's just part of her legacy going forward, and, uh, she has a few guest roles on TV after her show ends, and, um, she has her final supporting role in The Portrait in Black, which stars Lana Turner, who's one of my favorite actresses of all time. I think she's awesome. Anna's health, though, you know, we've been talking about it. It's been taking hits, and it doesn't allow her to take a role in the film adaptation of Flower Drum Song, which is, uh, which was has music by Roger and Hammerstein. And again, if you're living under a rock, King and I, South Pacific, Oklahoma, Sound of Music, all they Roger did, and Hammerstein They movies. did it all. On February 1st, 1961, she makes an appearance on the Barbara Stanwyck Show. You know, it was a short-lived sketch comedy show. Was, you know, trying to give women their own space in comedy in Hollywood, which I think is important. But for some reason, on February 3rd, 1961, a couple days after that appearance, she dies in her sleep at her home in Santa Monica. She is laid to rest with her mother and sister at the Rosedale Cemetery in the Pico Union District of Los Angeles. It's a very tragic end. It's, and it's always it's always rough to, like, see someone days before their death. Like, I know there was, uh, you know, Whitney Houston performance that was, like, days before. And same with same with here. Like, nobody could have possibly and known. And Prince. Yeah. Nobody could have possibly known that days later she wouldn't be around anymore. As said many times, anime was really a driving force to reduce the negativity in portrayals of Asian actors in Hollywood. In Europe and England, her films would appear in festivals decades after her death. And of course, gotta love them. Gotta love the gays. The gay community loves and reveres her forever. Um, so, you know, that negative press I, I think that history has absolved her of that. We could um, all only hope to be gay icons. Right. In 1973, the Asian American Arts Awards introduced the Anime Wong Award of Excellence, which is given out yearly still. Her life was also remembered in the play by Elizabeth Wong called China Doll, The Imagined Life of an American Actress, and this premiered in 1995. There is an extensive biography by Philip Liebfried and Chen Mi Lane called Anime Wong, A Complete Guide to Her Film, Stage, Radio, and Television Work, and that was published in 2004. And a year later, on the 100-year anniversary of her birth, there are two retrospectives on her life that are played at the MoMA and the Museum of the Moving Image in New York. 2009 saw an illustrated children's book on her story called Shining Star, the Anime Wong story. And more recently in 2019, Sally Wen Mao wrote a book called Oculus, which is a set of persona poems, which I have never heard of before, but they're basically uh, works that are all written in her voice, in Anna's voice. Finally, oh God, cringing at this, that Ryan Murphy 
Ryan Murphy of Glee had her portrayed by Michelle Krusiak, who was born in Taiwan. And I know Taiwan is complicated, but Jesus Christ, can we, like, respect the woman who was like, let's have Chinese women play Chinese woman by having a Chinese woman play her. But what do you expect from that's Ryan That's kind Murphy? of funny since the same nationalist government that's in charge in Taiwan today also was like, we hate anime Wong. And they're like, let's just pick someone Taiwanese. It's fucked up. Fucked up of them. And finally, um, more most recently in her legacy, the U.S. Mint has announced that this year, or maybe in the following year, I'm not sure how the Mint works, but she's going to be the first Asian American to appear in currency. It's on the quarter. Um, Ooh, let's we'll have to get one. Yeah, let's make it like a five dollar bill. Yeah, let's honestly let's get it uh, after Who's the on success. The Andrew Jackson, come on. Yeah. Oh Are yeah. We supposed, okay. Is it? We were supposed um, to get rid of him like years ago. Didn't we all agree Sojourner Weaver? Not Sojourner Weaver. Truth. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So yeah, guys, Sigourney Weaver alien no. fame is gonna be <laughs> on. The Ted. Sorry. Sorry, no. ancestors. I, I pray for forgiveness. <laughs> it, it will be received. But yeah, they were supposed to do that years ago. They're supposed to put her on it, and it's still Andrew Jackson. But yeah, hopefully we'll see some anime Wong quarters very soon. But yeah, I guess that's anime Wong. That is anime Wong, guys. Is this our last episode of 2021? No, we've got one more on the 28th coming out. Nice. Yeah. Cool. So penultimate episode of 2021. Thank you guys for being here and listening to our little show. Um, yeah, and we're going to keep trying to get the word out about our little podcast um, for moms, our podcast for moms, because clearly our clientele is history loving moms. Hell yeah. Because on Tuesdays we talk ghosts. Bye. <laughs>